This video will recap on what you talked about in your lesson with your teacher on C.S. Lewis's essay on three ways of writing for children. C.S. Lewis wrote this essay in 1952. In your lesson, you will have read Lewis's essay and you will have looked at the three ways that he believes people who write for children might use to approach their work. And of those three ways, he thinks two of them are good and one of them is not so good. It's generally a bad way of approaching writing for children. So of these three, which two do you think Lewis thought were the good ways to approach writing for children? Which one do you think is the one that he felt was generally a bad way to approach it? One, children's fiction should be written specifically with children in mind. So give them what they want, in other words. Two, children's fiction should be written ex tempore, so written as if it's being told in the spur of the moment, at that time, to one individual, an actual child, maybe someone from the author's life. And three, children's fiction should reflect the form of fantasy and fairy tales, but use these forms to explore the real issues of human life. Which of those three ways do you think Lewis thought were the right ways to write about children? The wrong way to write for children, according to C.S. Lewis, is to write specifically with children in mind. In other words, to give them what you think they want. Can you remember from your lesson, or can you think now, why do you think Lewis felt that children's fiction shouldn't be written specifically with children in mind? Because surely that would make sense on the surface. Have a think about that statement. What are the issues with it? What would be the problem with writing stories for children with only children in your mind when you wrote them? What are the issues with that? Some of the reasons that C.S. Lewis may have felt that this was the wrong way to write for children are as follows. If you are professing, if you are saying that you are writing to give children what they want, who are you to say that you know what children want? How do you know what children in general, all the children in the world, want from a story? It's quite a big statement. Secondly, why would what children want be any different from any other age? Why would you be able to distinguish what a child wants from a book as opposed to what a teenager might want from a book, what a middle-aged person might want from a book, or what an old person might want from a book? Thirdly, stories, wouldn't they be limited if you stuck to only the things that you thought a child would want in there? What would happen to everything else in the world? Would it just be edited out because it's not for children? And then finally, how would a child ever learn if all they see is what adults who do the writing think they should see for their age? How would they ever learn anything new? These are some of the ideas you will have talked about in lessons. There will be others that I'm sure you can think of. But hopefully um, you can see why C.S. Lewis thought that writing to give children what they want is the wrong way to go about it. C.S. Lewis felt that one of the good ways to write for children is to write ex tempore, which, if you remember, means it's written as if it's being told by the author in the spur of the moment, so at that moment, being told to one child, to a specific audience, and it might well be someone from the author's life. Can you think of any other stories that are told in this way? If you remember in Narnia, every now and again, the author or the narrator will drop in a little statement, for example, they say, because everybody knows that you should never close the door of a wardrobe when you get inside it, and things like that. So it's that kind of idea. It's as if the author is speaking to you in the here and now. Can you think of any other stories that are told in that way? And why do you think C.S. Lewis thought that this was a good way to write for children? What do you think he liked about this? Why do you think he thought this was a good way to write for children? One of the most famous examples of books written ex tempore would be the Lord of the Rings series by J.R.R. R. Tolkien. And this was actually who C.S. Lewis was referencing specifically when he spoke about this. Um, he approved of the method um, used by Tolkien. And also uh, Lewis Carroll does the same thing in Alice in Wonderland. Kenneth Graham does the same thing in The Wind in the Willows. 
and other stories. So some of the reasons why a writer might write in this way with these little asides to the reader is because firstly, it allows almost for a sort of dialogue between the reader and writer. It's almost like a two way experience of being spoken to aside from the plot of the story. This can make the story feel more personal. It's as if the author or the narrator is speaking from experience and stopping every now and again to add more information and depth to their story. It also allows the writer to remind or prompt the reader of other things or other moments from the story. Um, and it makes it quite realistic. It sounds like somebody speaking. It sounds like somebody telling the story. So you almost build more of a relationship with that author. So now we come to the second good way to write for children um, that C.S. Lewis wrote about in his essay, and this was his favourite way. C.S. Lewis felt that children's fiction, children's stories, should reflect the form of fantasy and fairy tales, but use these forms to explore the real issues of human life. So in other words, he approved of, he enjoyed, and he liked to use the form of fantasy and the form of fairy tales. So really traditional children's, stereotypical children's stories. But he, he believed that using those forms allows a writer to explore real human life in a different way by using fantasy. Why do you think he felt that? Why would Lewis say that fantasy is a good realm in which to explore reality. You might want to have a think about what we've been saying about Narnia and Boy Overboard. Why is it, have we said, that fantasy is a good way to look at reality? Another question you might ask yourself is how do fairy stories teach us about real life? Here are some of the answers that my class gave me when we looked at the benefits of writing in the fantasy genre or of using a fairy tale structure. So first of all, they said that when you write in the fantasy genre, characters who are in peril that aren't human can sometimes give us a new way to feel sympathy or empathy. So if um, a character who is going through a bad situation, but they're a rabbit, or a lion or a giant, we still feel that danger keenly, but we see it in a different way because they're not humans. So we look at it from a different part of our brain almost than we normally would. Secondly, they told me that fantasy scenarios often highlight reality just through the very contrast um, of the way that they're put across. So um, something might happen in a story that's completely fantastical and unrealistic, but just by way of presenting maybe life in that way or death in that way, it might highlight the reality of that um, more sharply for us and make us think about those things in a new way. Thirdly, fantasy scenarios can be metaphorical for everyday situations. So this in particular, thinking about the wardrobe, we had some amazing ideas put forward about the wardrobe, what it could mean metaphorically from life to heaven to death to an escape from war to um, imagination. So maybe um, writing in the fantasy genre allows us to give metaphorical um, spins on everyday life. Um, and then finally, we also talked about um, the way that unexpected events or what you might call unrealistic events that couldn't happen in real life, sometimes allow us to think about interactions um, and the way that we are without the baggage of humans and society. So when it's not humans having these things happen to them, it makes us, um, gives us freedom to think about these things in a different way. In his essay on three ways to write for children, C.S. Lewis talks about um, the ideas of Carl Jung, who was a psychologist who came up with um, 12 archetypes. And Jung believed that fairy tales, fantasy and fairy tales, liberate archetypes which dwell in the collective unconscious. 
They liberate archetypes which dwell in the collective unconscious. You will have talked about this in class with your teacher. Your first part of your homework is to explore these words one by one using lexicon. And again, you will have looked at this in class. There is a video on our YouTube channel as well that explains lexicon and what it is. But the words you need to look at are liberate, archetypes, dwell, collective and unconscious. Lewis believed, like Jung, that beings other than humans, which behave humanly, can convey psychology and character types more briefly than novelistic presentation and convey these things to readers whom novelistic presentation could not reach. In other words, what he's saying there is that if you have non-human characters, sometimes they can behave in a human way that shows the real psychology and character of humans way better than the a new creation of a human character could do. So I could write, for example, a story featuring a certain woman who is a certain way and I might want to get across that she's this particular type of person. Lewis's argument, along with Jung, is that if I was to, rather than put a woman in my story and try and create a character to explain to people this is who this woman is, this is what she's like, I could convey her personality but in the form of something else other than a woman and in doing so the idea is that the reader would pick up a lot more about what I wanted to say about that woman and her personality and her psychology than they would if I'd made her a human woman. So for example C.S. Lewis says um, on the back of reading Wind in the Willows he says the child who has once met Mr. Badger who is in the Wind in the Willows has ever afterwards a knowledge of humanity and of English social history, which it could not get in any other way. So in other words, you could read The Wind in the Willows, which you should do. And when you read about Mr. Badger, when you read his character and you understand his personality and you look at his psychology, you will know, and it's a fact you will, you will know, you will just understand more about what it means to be this particular sort of type of English person. Same as with um, Toad. If you read about Toad, you will understand the eccentricities of certain types of British people far more than you probably would if you were to meet them or read about them in another book or even read history books. Because just by way of putting that characteristic into an animal, somehow it's like magic. It liberates, as, as Jung says, it liberates these characters, these characteristics into something that we can all see clearly. So your second um, homework section is to have a look at um, Jung's 12 archetypes and we would have talked about these in, in the lesson um, and looking at these we would like you to think of three characters from books that you have read and it can be any book, any characters, and try and place them on the wheel of these Jungian archetypes. So can you think of somebody whose job, if you start in the middle, maybe think about someone whose role in that story perhaps was to connect to others in some way, and then have a look at your options there. So you've got the everyman, the jester, or the lover. Are they there to connect to others in an intimate way? Are they there as pleasure? Are they there to provide humour? Are they the comedic character? Or are they there to find a sense of belonging? Are they the everyman? So three characters from books you've read and try and place them on the wheel. Where would you place those characters? C.S. Lewis believed strongly that all stories in which children have adventures and successes which are possible, as in they do not break the laws of nature, but almost infinitely improbable, are in more danger than the fairy tales of raising false expectations in children. So all stories in which children have adventures and successes which are possible, but almost infinitely improbable, are in more danger than the fairy tales of raising false expectations in children.
What does this mean in simplified terms? What does he mean by that? And do you agree? So in short, what C.S. Lewis was saying there is summed up in the second quote from him where he says, I think what profess to be realistic stories for children are far more likely to deceive them. So we need to think about why this might be the case. How can reality be deceptive? So thinking about Boy Overboard in particular, that's a realistic story. How would Boy Overboard potentially be more deceptive for someone reading it? How would that be more likely to deceive somebody reading it than Narnia? That's the question. How would Boy Overboard somehow be more deceptive than Narnia? Following on from this, Lewis knew that fairy tales were often accused of giving children a false impression of the world that they live in. So there aren't castles everywhere. There aren't necessarily heroes. There aren't necessarily obvious villains and so on. Um, and also he recognised that some people feel that fairy tales teach children to retreat in a way, hide away in a world of wish fulfilment, fantasy, instead of facing the problems in the real world. Maybe he's got a point, maybe by reading books that are only based in fantasy, maybe um, you could argue that children don't learn to face reality as such. Before we look at why Lewis thought this wasn't the case at all, have a think about whether you agree with those statements. Do you think fairy tales give children a false impression? In what ways could you say that fairy tales give a very real impression of the world that we live in. You might sum up Lewis's attitude towards fairy tales and fantasy with the words brain, imagination and growth. Lewis believed overall that only fairy tales allow us to know ourselves truly, to really know who we are and to learn how life works and how to succeed. He felt, furthermore, that fantasy fiction gives children dimension and depth to the world that they live in. So something beyond the real that is possible to think about, something beyond what we normally consider on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, therefore, he said that in fantasy writing, the mind is not just concentrated on the self, the ego goes. Realistic stories concentrate our minds inwards. We think about ourselves and we think about us as humans and specifically actively think about who we are and what we would do. Fantastical stories push the mind outwards. We might think about what we would do, but largely we are looking at these other characters, these non-human characters, these non-realistic scenarios, and we're thinking about how life unfolds there, which gives us a whole new way of looking at the life we're actually living. For part three of your homework, we would like you to write a definition of the word ego. So you could use Google, you could search it up, you could ask somebody in your family, um, you could ask your teacher and make some notes, but we would write, like you to write a definition of the ego. So that concludes our little investigation into the essay of C.S. Lewis on three ways on writing for children. The moral of the tale, I wanted to finish off with um, some words from Lewis about the moral um, that's usually associated with fairy tales, um, the moral in the tale, as it were. His argument is an interesting one on this because he says, often writers will think about the moral of the tale before they've written the tale. So they will think, well, what moral do I want these children to learn? What moral do I want them to take from this? But he says, if you look here, he says it would be better to ask, what moral do I need? For I think we can be sure that what does not concern us deeply will not deeply interest our readers, whatever their age. So in other words, we should be asking ourselves as writers, adults, what do I need to learn? What do I need to do? Uh, but then he says, it's better not to ask the question at all. Let the pictures tell you their own moral. So tell the story and then the moral will appear.
Um, and if it doesn't, he says, don't put one in. For, and we'll finish on this, for we have been told on high authority that in the moral sphere, they, and that's you, children, they are probably at least as wise as we. C.S. Lewis says that children are at least as wise as adults. So there you go.